It's a great pleasure to welcome you all here th th this morning to this Terminos um, sponsored event. We're talking about artificial intelligence um, in payments. Um, for those of you who don't know, which is probably most of you, uh, my name's Adam Gable. I'm the uh, product director for financial crime mitigation and treasury at Terminos. Um, as someone who spent most of their career working um, in and around banks and trying to solve business problems with technology solutions, um, this subject particularly fascinates me. I feel like I'm, I'm still really on the periphery of fully understanding it and understanding you know, its usage and its application. But I, I, I'm enthused about this event. I think we've got a really good selection of panelists. Um, and I, I'm, I'm hopeful or optimistic that this can deliver a thought-provoking uh, conversation. Um, we've got a good uh, cross-section of the industry. Um, bankers, most importantly, technologists, analysts, uh, software vendors, so I think it's a good representation. And, and you know, all kind of leaders in the, their, their field and, and people that are, are pioneering the use of this technology. So as I say, I'm, I'm thoughtful it can deliver something, uh, hopefully it can deliver something quite thought-provoking. Um, with that, I'll introduce the panelists. Um, to my right, I have um, Vincent. Um, Vincent Brennan is Head of Group uh, uh, Payments uh, at Bank of Ireland. Uh, Vincent leads Bank of Ireland's participa participation in the UK and European payments industry, including the BPFI, um, UK Finance and the European Banking Association. Notably, Vincent is Deputy Chairman of the EBA uh, since 2014 and a board member since uh, 2007. Um, he's also Chairman of the EBA's Open Banking World Group, which has published a number of papers um, on payments um, and open banking. Um, Gareth Lodge, Senior Analyst for Payments at Sellant. Um, Gareth's research focuses on payments. As part of the payments team, his prime focus is on corporate payments, uh, working closely with uh, colleagues in the corporate banking team. Um, he's a leading expert on elements such as uh, bank payment processing and is, in fact, the analyst who's been covering uh, the industry for the longest. And I think he's got the most papers published in this area. Uh, Peter Zhu uh, from Microsoft, Business Development Manager. Welcome, Peter. Um, Peter has been at Microsoft since 2015, heading up their payments business. Uh, prior to joining uh, Microsoft, Peter was Managing Director of BNY Mellon, so he's really been out there in the industry, uh, looking after treasury services in the European market. And before that, was at Unicredito Group, uh, looking after global transaction banking. Chris Ryan is Vice President and Chief Technologist at Red Hat. Uh, Chris um, is Vice President uh, with leading up engineers who work on cloud computing, distributed technologies, software defined networking, uh, and network functions such as virtualization, containers, machine learning, and continuous delivery. And at the end, my colleague and friend, Daryl Proctor, who heads up our payments uh, and transaction banking group at Terminus. Uh, Daryl has been in banking for some 25 years working in and around banks and in the software industry. Um, coming into this session, a, a, a couple of things that, that um, I noted. Um, one was that in the first week of August alone, the Financial Times published no less than 19 articles talking about artificial intelligence, um, different facets of artificial intelligence. So <clears throat> I think it's fair to say, you know, uh, AI really is the hot tech topic of the year. And I think it would be good if we can explore some substance behind that. Um, the other thing I tried to do was, was try to define what AI is. And I think in its, its purest form, AI is machines imitating human intelligence. Um, Alan Turing, the grandfather of uh, modern computing, sets out the, 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 the Turing test, which says that if you can't uh, determine between the human and the machine, then the machine is really displaying some form of intelligence. Um, I prefer that, that maybe we've come to think of it as something else, you know, maybe a branch of computer science that encompasses a loose collection of technologies and techniques. Things like machine learning, we talk about machine learning, we hear about machine learning, um, RPA, robotic process automation, RDA, robotic desktop automation, um, a lot of talk about self-learning and algorithms. Um, I think to, to kick the conversation off, I think it'd be really good to understand a, a couple of things really is can we delineate what we mean by AI? Can we define it and what we're talking about nowadays? And also, you know, this question about the hype, is it a bubble? Do we think there's substance around um, a longevity to the subject? Or is it you know, something else that might come and go? Um, as you're closest to me, it makes sense that you 
kick off. Yeah, I guess um, I certainly you, you described it as a loose collection. For me, it's it's like a jigsaw of capabilities. Um, no one thing in its own right. Um, and I'll be honest in, in terms about the bank. The one that we've done most work so far on has been on the robotic process, process automation side. But the capability when you look at how you can interlink that with machine learning, with natural language processing, knowledge-based systems, image recognition, a whole jigsaw of capabilities put together has the potential to be really, really powerful. Um, is it hyper? Is it, is it real? Um, you know, two years ago, robotics process automation was kind of in the same vein as one of the hyped pieces. We've been able to do a huge amount of work in that space. But I think translating from hype to reality is actually about doing and getting into uh, proof of concepts and working with the technologies uh, fairly early. And we've certainly been uh, more than encouraged. We've been really pleased with the progress we've made on the robotics side. And so we think that there's real genuine opportunity on the uh, uh, AI side. And genuine substance behind Genuine it. substance behind, behind the capabilities. Um, Gareth, I mean... You spoke yesterday, you have opinions. I always have opinions, <laughs> as you'll be gathering. Uh, so I think for us, I mean, it's a question we get asked by our clients on a regular basis. And I think there's so much hype in the marketplace. You know, everything bar the kitchen sink has been described to AI currently. But I think we tend to talk in a more liberal sense to uh, our clients and say, well, think about what it does rather than necessarily what it is. Because as, as Vincent says, you know, it's a jigsaw of things. And it's also a spectrum of things. Some are perhaps will have some intelligence rather than intelligent, but equally some other things are perhaps game changers. I think it also doesn't I think it's also then thinking about how it fits together as you know, the jigsaw analogy. So if you think about a corporate treasure ringing uh, to query a transaction, they speak to a, a chat bot, which many people don't count as a, AI. That then uh, uses some uh, natural language processing, which some people do and some people don't, to then populate a form which RPA then does something with. That might not be artificial intelligence, but it's certainly clever. But it's also changing the customer experience for that corporate treasurer. So I think it's really focusing on what it does rather than necessarily what it is. That's the, the critical piece in all of this. The kind of EP. The output, if you want. Yeah, I mean, if you look at uh, someone like IBM, they describe it as augmented intelligence rather than artificial intelligence to show you're adding value rather than necessarily trying to replicate or, uh, 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 or, or get rid of some intelligence elsewhere in the system. Interesting, interesting. Peter, do you want to add to that? Well, uh, adding to that, in agreement with exactly both previous speakers, but I think, uh, for me, let's be clear, Artificial intelligence is not a product. It is really exactly that. It's a collection of a lot of different things. It's a powerful new technology. There are many powerful new technologies all coming to once, at once to banks, be it the shiny you know, house on the hill, as blockchain that we've all been reading so much about, or something deeper and more, and I'll, put it, I'll characterize it this way. I think artificial intelligence is really about transformation. Banks are really at the precipice and undergoing a lot of transformation. This is one of the key technologies that will enable it. We can hear a lot, and we'll talk later, I'm sure, about different use cases related to um, money laundering and this and that. But the thing about artificial intelligence is that it's a powerful technology. You've got to figure out how to use it, play with it. There are lots of vendors out there that have different offerings, maybe even as products, but it's really a matter of getting into using it. I'm sure we'll talk in more detail about automation and the need to change the actual business model of banks and what they do, but also very much the operating model. Hey guys, cost structure of banking as it was in an era where interest rates are zero and a lot of the old pre-crisis uh, streams of revenue were not there, cost structures are too high in banking. Mostly because banks are now, it's not a level playing field. Banks are competing with non-bank competitors and they are born in the cloud with a much lower cost structure. So things have got to change here. And artificial intelligence is a really key way to free up resources. I mean, show of hands, everybody could use more resources. Artificial intelligence can really help free up the resources to do other things. And so there's lots of different benefits. It's quite a long uh, discussion I think we'll be having. Yeah, absolutely. 
Speak into that. Trying to see definitely. Um, Is there anything that hasn't been said yet? That, that... Uh, well, I think I'm, I, it's never fun to have total agreement on a panel, but in, in this case, uh, I totally disagree. No. Um, <laughs> the I, I think of it as a spectrum, uh, and some of this includes kind of big data and analytics that we've already been doing. Uh, you've got traditional kind of rules or business process engines uh, that tip into uh, expert systems and, and machine learning systems. And it, from a buzzword, uh, it is easily abused. So we've done some work internally just to create a campaign to help educate um, uh, people at Red Hat to understand kind of what, what the terminology means, just so that you don't throw it around as um, a panacea that's going to solve all of, all of the issues that, that, face, that you face in any customer environment. Um, there, artificial intelligence is the broad term. There's subsets like machine learning or even narrower subsets like, like uh, deep learning, all of which are, are interesting technologies. Many of them are not new. So the concepts have been around for, for literally decades. Uh, so I think there's a, an interesting intersection of things happening at once that, that bring it to the forefront, and then you generate the hype cycle. So you get all of the AI-washed products um, that are just that. It's, it's not really, you know, it's buzzword compliant. It's not really employing interesting technology under the hood. Um, having said all that, I, I really do agree with the potential impact there. There's clearly, I mean, if you think about today, um, you've probably used your phone. You may have done a search on the internet. Typing into your phone, the predictive, uh, uh, the keyboard that's predicting what you're going to type, the search, the, the, the rankings of the information that's coming back to you, the ads that are placed, all of that is driven behind the scenes by machine learning already. So it's not really totally science fiction in future. Uh, but the application, the business-specific application, I think, is the important uh, question, and how we can harness that technology here will be a good part of the conversation today. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think the point is that the end is probably the most important. It's the practical high of the Everybody has a theory of what it is like to use this sort of technology. But until we start going down the road and actually playing with it, making it work, using it, and understanding that it's a question of cost, there's no theory of life changes. You know, we want that if we do it, we want all of those types of things that we won't really know what the true implication of AI is. One of the things I'm, I'm picking up as well, though, is, is that this is something that's new. Um, when you discover it, people are playing with it, getting ideas of, of its application. Um, I think it'd be interesting just to just to go out to the audience and take a show of hands on um, to get a sense of um, you know a sense check of how many people are involved in this, how much it's being used. Uh, maybe we can take a show of hands on um, how many people are working on projects that involve some of these technologies or actually working um, with applications in their workplace that are using some of these AI technologies. Okay, more than maybe would have expected, maybe fifty percent or something. I would guess a lot of that. Oh, I was just raising my hand. Ah, over there. <laughs> you surprised me. Um, okay, moving on to questions. I'm conscious that um, we've got a lot of questions to get through, um, and we're here to talk about payments. So one of the questions I'd like to ask is: taking this capability. Is in the payments field, we you know a lot. It's about uh, transactions per second, um, processing lots of lots of information. Is there an opportunity in the payments field for, for this technology? Um, yeah, very much so. Um, so I suppose already in the, on on the payment side of us, if if I look at the robotic side, you know we're using it in terms of uh, accelerating the process. You know, say me if I go back. It, if I had the opportunity and all the, the dollars I'd need to fully STP every process, then I might do less, for example, on the robotics process automation side. But that's never my reality. My real reality is I'll have at any time a number of very significant uh, STP or, or major transformation programs underway. 
But surrounding that is this whole uh, legacy area of customer service and, and, and payment processing or from customer initiation of payments right through to the, the settlement and reconciliation of it. That's not as SDP as I want. So that's the area that we've kind of focused in on is how can, how can we, can we uh, improve in that area. And there's huge opportunities right through from the customer initiation side and accelerating the pace at which that can be taken and, and processed through into back-end systems. Um, there's areas we haven't touched yet in terms of payments like routing, investigations, repairs, all of the inefficiencies and you know, from, from a bank point of view, as Peter says, that offer the opportunity to free out FTEs but also, as, as um, the speaker said, that actually offered the opportunity to improve it from a customer service point of view. So if you look at you know, a couple of things, opportunity to improve speed to market, opportunity to eliminate inefficiencies in the payment space, um, and then focus in on the particular areas. There's a rich, for me, a rich playing field. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Down to the customer. So Down, the out customer out to the customer and right back into the back of the bank. I, I would agree, the STP is is king within a bank here and certainly within payments. And we've actually been using AI for a number of years already in that space. If you think about um, pattern detection in fraud, for example, that is AI. Some of the sanctions checks where you're learning when a new name is added to the list and it's looking for other connections, that is a form of AI. What we're really talking about is the next step, how you spread that further and further. I think we're going to, later on we're going to hear some uh, examples of what banks are actually doing. I think the other lens we need to also have in the back of the mind is what our customer is doing and the implications. So uh, those of you who have Siri or Alexa who say, what is my bank balance? Or uh, can you pay my credit card bill? That is AI already operating outside of the banking industry that has a downstream effect on uh, payments. And as we move into the more internet of things and start building that in, there are implications in terms of risk and profiling, all sorts of other aspects that we also need to be aware of. So even if we don't want to apply it in our own banks for, for whatever reason that might be, and I, I can't imagine you wouldn't, we still have to be aware because of what's happening outside of the bank as well. Bingo. I mean, I think that says it really all. Banks are going to become more automated. But that's, I mean, the business model and the operating model are changing. If that's good news. That's not direct jobs. That's freeing up people to do more value-added things. Banks, think about floors of people in operations and what have you that could be doing more customer-centric things but are processing. So just at the baseline, it would be robotic processes of sorts and, you know, intelligence uh, that can help automate those things. Banks are just got to be the business model. When we talk about transformation, it's really, that's, at its essence, that's one of the things. The model that's been of a bank that I grew up in and that's been my life all along, I mean, that, that's got to change. The world has changed. The competitors have changed. The client demands, one could say, are, have always been the same, but the way that the banking industry responds to it. So it really is, um, I would say, a bit of a burning platform, that expression, but Banks need to transform how they do things to reduce the cost. But also the thing about robotic process engineering is um, uh, re -engineering, the quality is mm -hmm. consistent. Um, and, you know, it's great for people to be freed up to do other things just from sort of the drudgery. So I think the very baseline would be robotic processes. But then, of course, how long is the strain? We we'll call it maybe a takeoff point. In transformation, there's so many other elements that we'll be talking about on this panel that come into play for improved value, for improved quality, for improved lower risk, etc. I, I think there's the, to pick up on a point in terms of the floor of people that banks have to to do things. Think about you know an investigation that that Vincent mentioned earlier. So an investigation could be a corporate sending in an email saying, tell me what happened to my cross-border payment. Where is it at the moment? My beneficiary doesn't have that money. That's where I see artificial intelligence starting to play a point. You need people to answer that today. You need somebody to pick up that email and say, what is it doing? Go and investigate it and find it out. I think when you get to the point where that email is picked up by a machine that learns and understands and can trace based on the number and based on the words that he's saying, he doesn't know that who's responding is not a person. That's when you start, I think, getting to the point where it's mimicking what the human would have done in responding to that email. 
That's interesting. So I don't think we're probably all getting a sense of a couple of things. One, that there's an evolution from what has been, but also that there is maybe the opportunity for something more revolutionary almost, kind of a step change in, in how banks operate. And, and, and that's not, to say, that's not to say it's scary. I mean, that, in this room, let's, let's get into it. It's fun. It's interesting. There's lots of technology out there, lots of people to help, lots of vendors to help. I mean, it's really an interesting process. The, the key thing about banks is that they, the people in this room have the domain experience and understanding that a machine does not have. So it's a matter of process design and, and leading these projects to be able to improve things, to free yourselves up, to free up the bank. And to, and to improve results, which is what really the, where the pressure is going to be. Okay. okay. I, I, I think with, with that, I'd like to, um, so, so, you know, it sounds really interesting, like lots of potential. It'd be great if we can touch a bit on kind of real world examples, you know, of application and where benefits are already being delivered from using this technology. I'll, I'll come to you again, Vincent, yeah. because I, I, I know you're kind of at the forefront of some of these uh, activities. On the forefront, it's interesting. I mean, certainly we're engaged in it. And I mean, sometimes the best examples are very simple, simple things. And, and I suppose it's, it's where you can show an example where uh, leveraging these technologies on a single process doesn't just deliver, you know, the efficiency gain, but it's actually making an improvement from a customer point of view. As Peter said, it's making a huge difference from a risk point of view. And actually, I'll come on and talk in a second in terms of, or like from, from a people point of view. So I'll just take a, a, one of the, the early simple processes we automated where, you know, we, we had a situation where customers, you know, went into branches to conduct a particular um, process. We could have, have looked to set up a program to automate that end to end. We were heavily committed on something else. So we did two simple things. We actually used web-based forms to provide the customer with the opportunity to create the payment instruction at the front end. And we used the robotics at the back end to accelerate the pace in which that would otherwise be manually keyed into systems. But in doing that, uh, the, 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 the pace rate at which that could be done went from, you know, it was collected originally in the center, or in the branch, it got sent into the center, even if it was fax scanned in. There were just delays in times of doing it. The customer does it online now, the robotics picks it up. It's, it's done as quick as STP. But you're also able to link it then to your customer messaging piece. We've got that instruction from you, you know, and if it's, for example, a um, notice deposit, your deposit, we've received your instruction, that will now be paid into your account on the 24th of October, and on the 24th of October, no back to customers said that that's done. So you're actually improving the customer experience by simply by the, process, by the process that you've now got, the ability, for example, in this case, robotics, to link in with a lot of your other uh, systems. From a risk point of view, as Peter said, you know, the robotics, once it gets it right, it gets it right every time. Consistent. Consistent, so you don't have, you know, uh, input errors, you don't have check-in errors and whatever, so it's huge from that point of view. But if you think of it then from, from, from a people point of view, there's two impacts in it. One, it allows us to free up the people that were originally doing it and repurpose them towards something else, or in some instances people have a desire to leave and whatever, and that's fine. But on the other side, what you start to create in a center, and we've created a, you know, a, rot, a robotic center of excellence, is you're bringing, um, as I think it was uh, Peter or, or one of the guys said down along, who, who are you getting to do this work? In our case, we went out to the business and said, right, you want us to automate that process. Give us somebody who's a subject matter knowledge of an expert from your business, but is computer literate. They're not an expert in robotics. They're not an expert in AI, but they're clearly intelligent. They have an affinity towards that. They come in. They roboticize their own process working with the central team. Guess what? They do not want to go back. They're now saying, I know at least five other processes in our business that we could could do, and of course, their, their executive stroke business owner is saying, bring it on. And suddenly you have this organic growth in the central team rather than I'm having to go out to the market to hire it. And it actually switches it around to becoming a buyer's market rather than a seller's market, because actually people are now coming yeah, going, yeah. we've done it. So I suppose it goes back to this theme of the quickest way to learn is to start doing. And I think when you start doing, the pace at which you can accelerate is bounded only by the you know, extent to which you create the uh, central workforce, which is a combination of SME experts and the technology experts to work together, but from a business point of view. Excellent. And it's interesting that repurposing those people actually stimulating this enthusiasm. And, uh, Correct. Yeah. Correct. Um, you know, as somebody in the bank said to me when they joined the bank X number of years ago, computers was the place to work. Now, in, in, in our case, for a lot of people, people want to get into that center. Because they just see it as, you know, not just exciting for the, 
or for the sake of it, but actually they can are excited by what they can see. Challenging with will, and the business impacts that it's actually making. They can okay. see an opportunity there to make a real difference. Yeah. I think I mean, we would agree with all of those. And I think what's quite interesting, if you look at some of the, the metrics that go along with some of these things, it's not just about you know, FTEs, etc. You can put some really hard numbers on these. Um, so there's a, a number of case studies in the marketplace. Um, so Cooperative Bank in the UK uh, started with 10 RPAs as a, a kind of a test. Uh, and there are a couple of very specific ones to do with payments. One of it, it's a long story why, but uh, many chaps payments in the UK, so a wire payment, are um, initiated manually within the bank. And so on average, it was taking them about 10 minutes to send an electronic payment because they had to take the fax or the instruction and rekey it and, and send it off. They created an RPA. They can now do that in 20 seconds. So just think about that efficiency and the, the STP rate because it's, it's taking exactly the right data through. There's no rekeying or rekeying errors that can take place. They then applied it to the audit trails for when they've had a problem with a transaction. And on average, they were taking about seven hours to investigate from end to end. They can now do it in 10 minutes. So just imagine the time saving and cost savings with that. It's not so much they're getting rid of other people, it means they can scale the business. Those people can be applied to, to other areas. And if you look at someone, even in a, 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 a low cost uh, area, so ICICI Bank in India have been rolling out RPAs as well. And they started with uh, a half a dozen, <laughs> then they went to 200. They're now running 500 RPAs. <coughs> and on average across those, they're saving 60% uh, time. So that makes a big difference to those organizations. And so I think that's really what we, you know, why I was saying we look at the, the outcome rather than necessarily how you got there, because that's the, the thing that gets everybody else on board. Right. Show of hands. Who in this room thought they would grow up to become a policeman or a policewoman? <laughs> <laughs> right. Anti-money anti laundering is a classic example of how the industry, from the policy point of view, policymakers, I mean, banks have always been highly regulated, but money laundering, from a policy point of view, the responsibility, the onus has fallen on the banks. Oh, gosh, how are we going to do that? Well, we could have, and do, have armies of people looking for trends and trying to figure that out, because, by the way, if you fail to find that trend, the fines are staggering, as we've seen, or... Here's a great application, and there are some great vendors. So I'm just leading to the use case, obviously, for AML and how artificial intelligence can help identify, bring those things, put them on a dashboard intelligently. I mean, that's just from the flow of business. Banks are just great flow institutions. The economy flows through banks. That's the wonderful position that, that this room is in, and all of that data is there. But how on earth to interrogate? To understand what's there. We've all heard about big data projects for a long time. Things like artificial intelligence, classic, and there are some really great uh, vendors that are showing even here at Cybos things that are that are being done. My colleague here in the room actually from Hong Kong has been leading a project on this. So there's a lot of stuff going on and not difficult to find, but that's a great area where, where something like that, uh, artificial intelligence, is a great use case for, for how to improve that. Yeah. Talk a bit more about that in a moment. Uh, I have a vested interest. So. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, anything to add? Payments? Uh, uh, well, I, I've seen some similar. I think actually it's important to distinguish um, the intelligence part of AI from also just general automation. So I really do agree that automation is, is critical. If, if you look at the competitive landscape, um, you have you know, the, the broad the broad world, you've got transportation companies that don't own cars being leaders in the transportation industry of uh, service, hotel uh, services where the hotel service owns no properties. And you have banking systems where the banks don't actually own any assets. That's, that's a really different competitive landscape. And those small disruptive companies are doing that through technology. So the technology piece here, I think, is the automation is really critical. Uh, we've worked with some customers who have done uh, those same kind of rollouts of, of 
we often think of them as bots, but some kind of a, a small automation uh, uh, engine associated with a particular process. And anytime you have two humans who have to interact, that's an expensive interaction. It's going to be slow. You've got just the latency of, of people interacting with each other. You have potential time zones. You have things, are, uh, amazing internal processes like you can't speak to each other unless you fax them information, which doesn't even make sense today. Uh, and changing that to a digital automated workflow is, is what fundamentally transforms the, the business. Uh, and so we've seen customers start with these really simple uh, bots and, and RPA type of, uh, applications, grow them around every process that fits within, within your workflow to really achieve that, that core uh, efficiency. The, what I think is interesting in there is most, most of the AI hype talks about the, the promise of what it will un unlock and, and the value that you can generate from the data that you're collecting, which is all true. Uh, but this is sort of the, the core operational pieces. They're not the shiny, flashy parts of the industry, but it's actually the bread and butter of what is the business. Uh, and it, to me, that's what's exciting because it's, you know, it's easy to talk about the flash and the hype. It's, it's important to get into how do you actually move the business forward and, and really help uh, you know, businesses gain their core efficiency, which you know, we see it a lot just in the software creation process. Um, building software is a, you know, it's a human intensive process and every step where you can automate the creation, the testing, and the rollouts into production of that software that same concept holds true. It's independent of the actual workflow. That same concept holds true, freeing up the people to be creative and do the interesting parts. You know, what humans are, are really good at is creative thought, and what machines are really good at is high-speed, repetitive tasks. You know, let's let's harness those strengths and and really help push the industry forward. Thanks. Our pilots. Uh, Nothing to add to that one. Nothing to add to that one. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Um, Peter, you touched on financial crime, uh, uh, something I like to look after financial crime at Seminos, and there are a couple of use cases that we're working on and delivering on. Um, one of which you touched on was this, this identification of anomalous behaviour, having lots of data and um, using these techniques to identify uh, anomalous behaviour. Um, the other um, being around RPA, actually, just in terms of uh, false positives are uh, uh, an industry issue. Um, impact structural costs significantly. I think it's something like 76% of compliance spend goes on, on headcount. Um, so we're uh, looking at some form of bots to um, improve that process, look at how um, alerts have been previously dealt with, look back at the history of those, uh, the entity that's raising the alert, uh, message that's similar to that message, how it was dealt, dealt with previously, and then suggesting the next best, best action or even taking the next best action. Um, I think financial crime is a good use case for this type of technology. Do you think payments can benefit from um, you know, this application? And is, is, in fact, is there overlap um, between the two? And I think that's, that's kind of where I'm coming from in terms of artificial intelligence. Is we've spoken about RPA, which is a process that is automated. When those processes start talking together and working together, rather than in isolation, I think then it starts becoming intelligent, um, to quote what, what, what Gareth says. So, you know, it, it's fine if I have a, a bot that looks at, or, a, or an RPA process in financial crime that can help the false positives and get it all, all working the way it should work, but what happens to the payment flow as part of that? Where does that stop? So that stops now, and it waits for a response. Okay, this is what's going to happen. What happens if that response is wrong? When those two processes start talking and becoming intelligent, that's when I think we start having a real change in yeah, okay. <clears throat> you know, we've, we've spoken about the opportunity in the, the real world application. Um, you know, you hear things uh, talk of like a fourth industrial revolution and maybe some kind of you know, really impactful uh, change arising from, from AI. Um, can we take a sense of, of if, if, you know, do we believe that this is the tip of the iceberg that, uh, um, <laughs> I mean, you know, sorry, yes. I mean, 
beyond the drudgery of repetitive processes that need to get automated if we are, and there's so much more. This is, uh, I think we're all in this room at the, at the cusp of a creative process. And just think about your dreams about what you would imagine. I remember working on so many projects on cash flow forecasting. What a way to, you know, how to do this. Well, we've got to get the account payable and the account, we got account receivable file, we got to crunch it together, but where are we going to get the, you know, all of that. When you think about how artificial intelligence and machine learning can be applied to that for your clients. So even in payments, you're sitting there, as we used to do, sitting there at five minutes of three in the afternoon before deadline, <coughs> and your account is 20 million short, and you're thinking, holy cow. But every day at four minutes before three, you know, Citibank sends across that big funding. The machine, though, went, so you could sit there, and then you're out sick one day, and your colleague is sitting there trying to figure out, okay, so where's the next 20 million so I can make my final payments? But with machine learning and artificial intelligence, it gets a sense. It understands the flows, where things are coming from. It really helps understand. So doing cash flow forecasting just in terms of you doing payments or providing value-added services, it's the whole, I mean, P2P is another area, an entirely different area, where the whole credit process is not based on analyzing assets or anything like that in balance sheet. It's about understanding flows, and payments are the main flow in the bank. And when you really understand those flows, or when the machine understands it, because we can't do it. We don't, you know, we're humans. We can't master the, the mega data that goes through. Um, so it's really, those are some huge areas that are beyond robotic processes, which I think are the core thing that we've been talking about. There's so many exciting areas for this that you can just sort of dream what you could do with this stuff. Mm -hmm. That interests me. There's something we haven't touched on that much is the, 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 the kind of quantity of data we have now. Mm. Is that significant, do you think, in, in, well, in think, driving? If we go back to where we started the conversation, whether we talked about it as a continuum or a um, collection of, of things, loose collection or, or a jigsaw, even widen the jigsaw out a bit to some of the other topics that are really relevant to the audience here. So if you take the move towards real-time payments, if you take the move towards ISO 2022, so you've now got the speed at which enriched data can move, add that in then with big data and analytics. I mean, we're just unquestionably on the cusp of, of a massive transformation. It's really, for me, a case of how quickly at an individual level, but also at an industry level, can we assemble and, and leverage the power of, of these different jigsaw pieces. But, you know, when you piece that all together, it's just incredibly powerful um, what you could potentially do, but you've got to start doing it. I think there are, we're definitely on the cusp, but the prob not a problem, let's be positive, a challenge might be for the industry is the pace of regulation keeping up with it. So regulation tends to look at what's happened and say, well, you can't do that anymore because this, that, and the other. It doesn't anticipate about what's going to happen. So if you look at something, all the Europeans in the room should be frightened about the general data protection regulation. That finds you up to 4% of your global annual turnover for every breach of the GDPR. Now, do you know what your AI is doing and whether it's compliant to the GDPR? Because that data is getting used for more and more purposes. And equally, the customer, particularly the consumer, has to give their consent in how it's used. Are they able to differentiate, well, I want it for this, but not that? And so it is solvable, but at the moment, it's not keeping pace with what is possible. And so we're going to have, uh, uh, I guess, a dynamic tension as we kind of test the boundaries of where this regulation in terms of principles rather than the hard and fast rules and some of these things uh, going forward. And that might pose some challenges going forward, because if we think of some AI that we're so that in the GDPR, there's a difference between the data owner and the data processor. And if that data processor is some software that's running in the cloud, who actually is the data processor, particularly if it's an industry thing? So again, even some of the terminology isn't necessarily up to speed with where it needs to be going forward. All solvable, but not there. Yeah. Anything uh, I was thinking about the ethics in that whole discussion. Oh, well, I was going to touch on that, so I think that's interesting uh, what you say, Gareth. I, I mean, there are, I mean, that, Gareth raises a lot of points. 
this is not a panacea. I mean, when is artificial intelligence also artificial stupidity? So you know, the, machine, <laughs> the machine is learning, and it's like, a, a, you know, the caution, the little kid learns swear words. Oh, you're not supposed to learn that. Yeah, but the machine has got an algorithm, and it's learning. So it's a matter of design. It's a matter of thinking that through. It raised a lot of issues. Uh, GDPR, uh, the uh, data protection. There's, uh, there's ethical issues. You know, when is it, the machine going to inadvertently discriminate? So you know, there's a whole process you have to go through. Uh, but but the, the, the pathway toward transformation is clear. The issues and the technology is not futuristic. It's here and now, here and now. So it's a matter of how do we start to play with it and figure these things out with caution, so it's not a panacea, but to actually make it productive for the bank. And I think that's really the, 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 the key thing to think through. Yeah, I, I, I think, um, I apologize, all my references seem to be British references. Um, Stephen Hawking, famous uh, physicist, cosmologist, talks about AI as being, you know, um, you know our potential greatest success, but uh, kind of adds this caution about it could be, you know, humankind's potential demise. Um, I think on that, in fact, I'm halfway through reading uh, uh, Yuval Noah Harari, Homo Deus, the uh, historian and anthropologist, and he, he, he charted mankind's history from you know, the Great Rift Valley, and now he's plotting the next hundred years. And as well as bioengineering, he, he cites that AI has the potential to create this kind of workless generation and, and these kind of quite alarming cautions. I think a couple of things for me. One, you guys working out there trying to apply this technology. I think it'd be interesting to do the sanity check, and I, I think you've touched on it, um, kind of cautionary tales, things that people should look out for. But even maybe just touch on that ethical thing is, if this is a burgeoning um, um, evolution, is now the time that people should be thinking about these things? Um, so, so maybe <coughs> to look at two sides of that question. One in the first instance is, when you look at its potential, but you look at potentially the regulatory challenges, when you look at its potential, but you know you can learn stupidly as well as learn intelligently. <laughs> Take all of that. From my perspective, the way to best ensure that you get the best outcomes, not necessarily the perfect outcome, the best outcomes is, base this in your business. While it is you know, technologies and, 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 and increasingly complex technologies, in the end of the day, build the delivery of this in your business. Why? Because it's the nature of the business to focus on business outcomes. It's the nature of the business to focus on the balance between outcomes and regulation. It's the base of the business to focus on building control in alongside to, to doing it. Um, and if you come at it that purposefully way and you set out going, actually with each implementation we have to do, we've got to do our risk and control process across it to ensure that we've captured all of the risk-related stuff, the compliance stuff, whatever you're going to be far better than having it in a, an innovation lab where theoretically it's fantastic but worth it doing. So that's one side of it. The second side is, yeah, it, I mean, it is at one level um, scary to think, you know, potentially the, the, the impact of all this. I was driving last year and heard that at uh, one of the G7 summits, there was, they were having a conversation as to the long-term implication for workforce of you know, the collection of these technologies. Um, but at the same time, uh, like I, I live in a household where I've got a 17, 19, and 22-year-old. And they have a very different perspective on work and life than I have. Uh, they have a very much different perspective in terms of a work-life balance and what they want to have. So maybe in a sense that there, you know, there is the, the extreme ethical piece in terms of who we work on. But actually, I think what it's going to do is just going to change the nature of work. And generations just adapt over time to the nature of work uh, yeah. that surrounds them. So... I'm not saying that's going to be the perfect balance e yeah, either, yeah. but maybe this old grey-haired 55-year-old is not necessarily the smartest person to be thinking about some of those things, because I just see my kids have a very different attitude. I think it's interesting, the, 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 the previous bit about don't make it a technology exercise, yeah. um, keep it grounded in the business. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot to be said for that comment, because you get the technologists who love to play with the, the technology, and let's make this thing do this, that, and the other. And then you get the business people that are saying, oh, hang on a bit here. What happens if I make the wrong decision? What happens if I allow that payment to go out because I'm ex the, the, the process is, well, I'm used to receiving the, the shortfall you know, in that last minute and that money doesn't come in? Whose fault is it? You know, I, I think that's when you start becoming, uh, and uh, back to Vincent's point, you need somebody that understands the business but has a leg in technology um, to really make this work properly. But let's also be clear. Everybody in this room, I mean, payments are moving 
what payments are moving electrons. Everybody in this room, and don't think it's over to you technology IT. Everybody has to think and own this as business people. And I think that's part of the reshaping um, that's within banks, whatever their structures are. It's, all of us are required to know and understand this, and I think very much build exactly on that. So it's, these are core business issues. This is not an IT discussion. These are core business issues. I'm a, I'm a technologist. Um, <laughs> and I couldn't, I couldn't agree more because what I see is te technology gets, um, I guess, it looks exciting and it has this promise of solving problems. What's really difficult, so it's easy to bring technology in and apply it to a problem. What's really difficult to do is create the internal cultural shift around the technology to actually put it to real use and get the business outcome that you're looking for. Um, so. We, we focus a lot at Red Hat on, on not just the technology side, but trying to help understand uh, both ourselves and with our, with our customers what that cultural shift looks like. Um, but I wanted to touch on two other things. One was what's happening right now is we have really volumes of data that we've never seen. So you look at the analyst statistics and you see something like 90% of all data was created in the last two years or, or you know, some sort of staggering numbers. A lot of that is pictures of cats on the internet, so it's not all <laughs> relevant here for payments. But um, the other piece that goes along with that is we have uh, kind of massive amounts of compute power harnessed in through easy, easily accessible interfaces uh, in the cloud. And we have hardware that's changing that allows us to actually create the insights or the mathematical linear regressions or you know whatever whatever it is that you're actually divining information uh, models out of information that's sitting there. That is fundamentally different, and that is why this is the tip of the iceberg. It's why we're at a point in time that's changing. The, the AI concepts are old, but the point in time that we are today is unique. Uh, so that is really exciting, and the, the kind of garbage in, garbage out challenge is where, you know, how can you be regulatory, uh, how can you be compliant with, with regulation um, when you're not clear what's happening inside a black box? So we've talked to some of our uh, friends in the large-scale labs, and they're producing volumes of data, and creating mathematical equations to explain the data, and they don't understand the mathematical, mathematical equations. So that's, that's a challenge, and that makes it difficult to be compliant with regulation. Uh, and we know things like loan application processing, which can be uh, improved and automated through some kind of AI and natural language processing, the, the history that you have in terms of how you um, accept loans have biases. And the idea that the machine is unbiased is, is true to the extent that it's only doing what it's trained, but it's trained with biased data. And so fraud detection is something that becomes an arms race with a different type of uh, craft, clever criminal who's looking to cheat the algorithm because it understands how it's been biased. And this is a really... These are the core challenges that we have ahead of us, uh, and you know it's, it's 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 exciting. It's not it's not daunting, but it, it is real. We can't we can't just ignore it. Just one extra point, I guess, mm -hmm. building from what you said, back, uh, Chris, about all the cats on the internet. I don't think we're sitting here saying you ought to automate every single process across the bank tomorrow. In reality: there are processes that work just fine. But equally, and Vince and I were talking about this beforehand, unless you understand the process you were trying to automate, you're going to get that rubbish in, rubbish out. So, you know, sometimes you have, you'll be looking at a process and say, actually, you just need to redesign yes. that for, before we even think about automating it because it's not going to be any better. It would just be faster, worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, good point. It, 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 Kind of leads into the um, a discussion around what are the you know, what are the range of skills that you need to build around working in this space. So quite apart from the technical knowledge in terms of the um, 
machine learning or advanced analytics and that. Actually, to be successful in it, you need to build a team that have process analysts, business analysts, people that understand the business, risk people or whatever. And if you can build that collaborative model, then you're in a far better piece of being able to target the right areas to address, leverage the technology in the way that it is intended, pointed towards business um, outcomes that, you know, that, that are achievable. And actually, as Chris said, in that way, actually build and live the culture that you're, 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 you're trying to create. So it isn't just enough to have the AI experts. You actually just need to repart or to reform teams to actually start to work collectively. Just, to be on this. Not just the future of data science. No, it's not. And I think the other piece is, you know, um, the better your team understands the technologies and the capabilities, the better then you're able to engage with potential partners, vendors, etc. Because you can then know exactly what it is or what part of the uh, the jigsaw you're trying to fix that they can actually contribute to. If you don't understand it, you'll just be um, you know, starry-eyed yeah. at the prospect, you know, because firms are very professional and coming towards you and, and, and selling, selling something. But the better your team understands this, the more you have to pick and choose between your, your potential partners and collaborators. Yeah. Really good, really good. I'm, I'm conscious of time. Um, I just want to underscore that, that cross-functional team point is it's that is your it's it's so critical to cultural shift in an organization and it only takes one to be a seed for change so it's that it's finding that right cross-functional team to to create a vision for you know the broader the rest of the teams really good um, for me it's been really interesting really useful i think you've all contributed Excellently. I, I, we've, we've touched on the opportunity. There's definitely opportunity um, in payments, but broadly in banking. Um, and, and, and I, you know, we put some definition around what we're talking about when we talk about AI. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, generally a, a really good conversation. Um, I think to go back to the audience and, 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 and get a sense, given what we understand, I, I, particularly some of those real world um, examples, I think, I think are excellent for, for people and they're excellent for me as well. Um, I think given what we've spoken about, it'd be good to go back to the audience and just get a sense of who, with what we've now learned, believes that um, AI has, has a place in payments and is likely to be used in, in this way. Um, maybe a show of hands would be interesting. Yeah, pretty, pretty conclusive. Almost 100%. Um, I'd like to thank the panelists for uh, their participation. Really, really good. Um, I, I leave on one note, which uh, someone sent me um, a mail telling me, you know, how, how humans are indispensable. Um, the things that humans can be unrivaled in are value judgment, creativity, passion, intuition, dreaming, design, empathy, generalization, abstract, abstraction, critical thinking, and hopefully common sense. So, <laughs> Given that and what we've learned today, hopefully there's a future for all of us. Um, but, but hang on, on that point, just to be really clear, <laughs> I'm sorry, artific intelli artificial intelligence is not a replacement for humans. Banking is a people business, it has always been a people business, and will be a people business going forward. This is a matter of um, facilitating the, the business model, the operating model, and limiting the drudgery and some of the other things that I go I think someone touched it. Oh, oh mentioned. I've mentioned. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming.